If you're tired of these promos, supporters get the podcast early and ad-free. Just go to donate.bogosity.tv for the links to sign up. Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the week of February 6, 2022. The podcast that knows the trouble you've seen. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's mathematize the news of the bogus. So there's a bit of good news in the Julian Assange case. The British High Court of Justice has greenlit his appeal to the UK Supreme Court. For some reason, the mainstream media was saying that Assange lost, because I guess the only thing they can do about Assange now is tell outright lies. Not that that's anything new with them. Assange's partner, Stella Morris, said, quote, What happened in court today is precisely what we wanted to happen. The High Court certified that we had raised a point of law of general public importance, and that the Supreme Court has good grounds to hear this appeal. The situation now is that the Supreme Court has to decide whether to hear the appeal, but make no mistake, we won today in court. Rebecca Vincent of Reporters Without Borders concurred, quote, We welcome the High Court's decision to allow Julian Assange the right to appeal his extradition case to the Supreme Court. This case will have enormous implications for journalism and press freedom around the world, and could be hugely precedent-setting. It deserves consideration by the highest court in the land. We very much hope that the Supreme Court will indeed accept the case for review. The Committee to Protect Journalists welcomed the decision as well, quote, We are glad that Julian Assange will be allowed to apply to appeal his extradition in the UK Supreme Court. The prosecution of the WikiLeaks founder in the United States would set a deeply harmful legal precedent that would allow the prosecution of reporters for news-gathering activities and must be stopped. We strongly encourage the US Justice Department to halt extradition proceedings and drop all charges against Assange. Like that'll happen. We covered how the High Court fell for the laughable assurances of the U.S. government that Assange will be well cared for in prison, despite their extensive record to the contrary. Also, recently declassified documents show that Lord Chief Justice Ian Burnett has a conflict of interest in the case. His close friend of 40 years, Sir Alan Duncan, was a key official in the campaign to force Assange out of the Ecuadorian embassy. Additionally, as Morris points out, quote, Let's not forget that every time we win, as long as this case isn't dropped, as long as Julian isn't freed, Julian continues to suffer. For almost three years he's been in Belmarsh Prison, and he is suffering profoundly, day after day, week after week, year after year. Julian has to be freed, and we hope that this will soon end. We are far from achieving justice in this case because Julian has been incarcerated for so long, and he should not have spent a single day in prison. If there had been justice, the officials who plotted, who conspired to murder Julian, would be in the courtroom right now. If there were justice, the crimes that Julian exposed, war crimes, the killing of innocent civilians, would not be impugned. Our fight goes on, and we will fight this until Julian is free. Here's hoping justice will finally prevail. If you're looking for a way to support this channel, but you don't have any spare cash and you can't stand ads, you can do so by generating your own cryptocurrency. Use the links at the bottom of the description to follow the link to odyssey.com to listen to the podcast and see all of my YouTube videos as well. Just watching videos will produce cryptocurrency for the creator and yourself. And since Odyssey is always monetized and never censored, you'll have no problem seeing all the videos from your favorite creators. You can also use the library credits you created Odyssey to tip creators and even purchase paid content. Earn library credits through various rewards, including daily view rewards and the number of shares and invites. And you can interact with creators in all sorts of ways, including like and dislike, comment, boost a post by supporting it, repost it, and share to other sites, all while earning crypto for the creator. Easily monetize yourself and your favorite creators using cryptocurrency, without advertising. Use the link below to visit this channel on odyssey.com and see many of your other favorites there as well. 
So we've been hearing a lot of bogosity about ad blockers that seems to have been increasing as of late. They've been called tools of piracy, of hacking, of copyright infringement, and all sorts of mean, nasty, ugly things. A lot of the fear-mongering of them has come from the CIA and NSA, but as it turns out, they both use ad blockers to protect themselves when browsing the web. In a letter to Congress dated last September, the chief information officer for the intelligence community said, quote, The IC has implemented network-based ad blocking technologies and uses information from several layers, including domain name system information, to block unwanted and malicious advertising content. As we've covered in the past, online advertisements have been a huge vector for malware and ransomware, and at best, are an enormous privacy concern. So Senator Ron Wyden urged the Office of Management and Budget to do the same for federal networks. Quote, I have pushed successive administrations to respond more appropriately to surveillance threats, including from foreign governments and criminals exploiting online advertising to hack federal systems. This includes seemingly innocuous online advertisements, which can be used to deliver malware to phones and computers, often without requiring users to click anything. This malware can steal, modify, or wipe sensitive government data, or record conversations by remotely enabling a computer's built-in microphone. NSA guidance dating back to 2018 made a similar recommendation and two years later made the same recommendations about privacy settings that limit ad tracking. A year ago, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency gave similar guidance, recommending ad blocking software to protect against both malicious ads and data collection. It's a shame that advertisers can't make them any better when so many producers on the web depend on them for a significant share of their income but they just can't seem to make them anything but obtrusive, obnoxious, and a threat to privacy and security. If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government censors. It's essential in this day and age, so go to vpn.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world, and they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home, and don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. You can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. Something else that's been the subject of a lot of bogus fear-mongering is cryptocurrency, and regular listeners don't need me to list it all here. The International Monetary Fund certainly sees it as a threat, and they've recently lashed out at El Salvador after the country made Bitcoin a form of legal tender. In their 2021 Article 4 consultation with the country, they identified, quote, persistent fiscal deficits and high debt service because their deficit is a whopping 5% of GDP. If only ours was so low. But they also said, quote, Since September 2021, the government has adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. The adoption of a cryptocurrency as legal tender, however, entails large risks for financial and market integrity, financial stability, and consumer protection. It also can create contingent liabilities. Wow, what are they so afraid of? Well, don't all answer at once. In their report, they said that IMF executive directors, quote, emphasize the need for strict regulation and oversight of the new ecosystem of Chivo and Bitcoin. Yeah, good luck with that. Quote, they stress that there are large risks associated with the use of Bitcoin on financial stability, financial integrity, and consumer protection. Yeah, the risk is that those things might actually happen. Quote, They urge the authorities to narrow the scope of the Bitcoin law by removing Bitcoin's legal tender status. Some directors also expressed concern over the risks associated with issuing Bitcoin-backed bonds. 
Given the IMF's track record, I don't think they're in any position to talk. The IMF basically uses its loans as a strong arm to push certain economic policies, policies which, for one example, resulted in the 1997 Asian crisis where several Asian countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, saw their economies slow to a crawl. They infamously create moral hazards while having virtually no transparency or accountability. The IMF is effectively a branch of the U.S. Treasury, which holds almost a fifth of all its shares. IMF bailouts and inflationary policies seem to have much better results for the U.S. government than they do for the countries they give the loans to. Those countries generally end up dependent on the loan money over a period of decades, and therefore they tend to be subject to following whatever the U.S. wants. So this advice shouldn't in any way be seen as having the intent to actually benefit El Salvador. It's actually a threat to the IMF and the U.S. government. Fortunately, El Salvador seems to be resisting it. Treasury Minister Alejandro Zelaya said, quote, No international organization is going to make us do anything, anything at all. Countries are sovereign nations, and they take sovereign decisions about public policy. Hopefully they'll also resist the urge to try and regulate it, which is something that is actually impossible and they'll only hurt themselves by trying. Maybe they'll also open it up to other cryptos as well. Do you have children? Or nieces or nephews? Are you homeschooling? Or just want to counter some of the socialist indoctrination most children get in school? If so, go to bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins and you'll be taken to a website where you can get some great books for elementary age children. The Tuttle Twins books are books about liberty and free market economics that include children's versions of Bastiat's The Law, Leonard Reed's I Pencil, and Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, as well as books about the Federal Reserve and how regulations protect business cronies. They'll learn about the harm caused by eminent domain or regulations passed in the name of safety and fundamental concepts of liberty. And as you can see from the sample pages on the website, they're all easy to read and nicely illustrated. They're just $9.99 a piece, or get a special discount as well as free bonuses when you purchase all five. You can even buy in bulk to donate to schools and local libraries. So get the Tuttle Twins books at bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins. <laughs> And now it's time to crenellate this week's biggest bogani emitter. And this week it goes to the U.S. Department of Justice, because we know they've been lying about Julian Assange, but now we have not only undeniable confirmation of that, we also know who they were using. Sigurd Thorderson was a major witness in the case against Assange, and he's just admitted to fabricating his accusations. Thorderson has a documented history of sociopathy and has several convictions for the sexual abuse of minors, so nice to know the DOJ is still keeping the same company they always have. Thorderson also has a history of financial fraud, which is another thing that can endear a guy to the U.S. government. U.S. authorities used Thorderson to build a case against Assange, maintaining the fiction that he was a close associate against Assange when, in fact, he'd only volunteered on a limited basis to raise money for WikiLeaks back in 2010, money he ended up embezzling. The court documents didn't even refer to Thorderson by name. They just referred to him as teenager, even though he's 28 years old. They were using him to shore up the conspiracy charge against Assange during the time he was living in Iceland. They falsely accused him of hacking into the computers of members of parliament and recording their conversations. In fact, Thorderson told Icelandic newspaper Stunden that none of it is true. Assange never asked him to hack or access anything. Nothing to do with any phone recordings of MPs, nothing. But all of those facts were accepted by the British courts. Judge Vanessa Bereitzer denied the extradition on humanitarian grounds, but sided with the factual arguments of the DOJ, which are now thoroughly debunked. Likewise, for the claims that Assange and Teenager tried to decrypt a file stolen from an Icelandic bank and gain unauthorized access to a site used to track police vehicles. Thorderson provided several hours of chat logs from the time when he was volunteering for WikiLeaks, showing that no one at WikiLeaks, least of all Assange, had any knowledge of Thorderson's contacts with hacking groups. 
In fact, they showed quite clearly that, in making requests to various hacker groups, he'd completely inflated his position in WikiLeaks, describing himself as chief of staff, head of communications, number two in the organization, all sorts of things. But Thorderson never even claimed that anyone inside WikiLeaks had instructed him to make these requests. In fact, he himself hacked WikiLeaks and stole copies of their hard drives. In summer of 2011, he had established contact with a member of the Lulzek hacker group nicknamed Sabu. The thing is, Sabu was an informant for the FBI, and they used this as an opportunity to implicate Assange. Later that month, the FBI used him to oversee a DDoS attack on several government institutions to blame on WikiLeaks fooling the Icelandic government into cooperating in the case against him. Ugmundur Jonasson, then Minister of the Interior, said, quote, They were trying to use the things here and use people in our country to spin a web, a cobweb that would catch Julian Assange. What I have been pondering ever since is if the spinning of the web had already started then with the acceptance of the letter rogatory establishing cooperation that they could use as a pretext for later visits. But Thorderson's cooperation with the DOJ meant that he now had immunity, which he used to fleece both individuals and companies on an even bigger scale. Accusations of theft, embezzlement, and forgery kept piling up, but Thorderson keeps dismissing it all as normal business practices. He hasn't yet been charged with anything. The DOJ knew it was all bogus from the start, but they were determined to build the case against Assange, and no lie was too big, regardless of the consequences. So that has to make the DOJ this week's biggest bogan emitter. I want to tell you about the eyeglasses I've been wearing for years. As people can see on my videos, I have a very strong prescription, which makes glasses more expensive, especially when I need computer glasses, reading glasses, prescription sunglasses, and most expensively, progressive lenses for general everyday wear. To save money while still getting quality glasses, I get them from Fermu. In fact, I just got a pair of progressives with high-index aspherical lenses and a nice pair of frames my wife loves for just over $100. It would have been $500 to get them through my eye doctor. Not only do they look good, the glasses are durable. I've worn many pairs for several years without problems. All orders come with a 30-day return policy, a 3-month warranty, and one-on-one -on -one customer service. Go to Firmu, that's F-I-R-M-O-O dot Bogosity dot TV anytime you need quality glasses at a low price. Once again, that's Firmu dot Bogosity dot TV. And now let's qualify this week's Idiot Extraordinary! And this week, it goes to pretty much all police everywhere for unashamed use of their new bogus pretext to infringe on your Fourth Amendment rights. It's just the next step in a long procession. It used to be cops would just say, I smell weed, as a pretext for a search, and courts would just accept it, no matter how many times it comes up empty. We've covered individual cops who've used that excuse hundreds of times with no weed ever found, and the courts still just take their word. When in doubt, they just get permission from a dog. The dog, whose motivation is nothing other than to please its master, alerts the handler that the drugs are there, effectively testimony that can't be challenged. And now, their latest con is one they seem to be buying into themselves. It's basically, I smell weed, plus I feared for my safety, except it's not about weed, but fentanyl. And the claim is that the mere odor of fentanyl is a credible threat to one's life. So no matter how much they've outnumbered, outgunned, and outarmored the suspects, they're in fear for their lives and can do whatever they want. Police from all over the place are also claiming to have suffered near-fatal overdoses from accidentally touching fentanyl. A Sacramento Bee article was headlined, Deputy Nearly Dies of Fentanyl Overdose. A statement from the Santa Rosa Police Department read, Officer exposed to fentanyl and transported to local hospital. And a CNN story from 2017 was headlined, 
Police officer overdoses after brushing fentanyl powder off his uniform. There's just one teensy-weensy problem. It's impossible to overdose from direct contact with fentanyl or from breathing its odors. Fentanyl patches work by having the fentanyl in an alcohol or glycol solution, but in powder form, fentanyl cannot be absorbed by the skin. And according to doctors and toxicologists, the bogosity the police psychopaths are spewing is causing real harm to overdose victims, taxpayers, and first responders. According to Dr. Ryan Marino, medical toxicologist and addiction specialist, accidental overdose by skin exposure is, quote, chemically and physically implausible, and added, quote, people should not be in jail for imaginary crimes. Dr. Andrew Stolbach, emergency physician and medical toxicologist at Johns Hopkins, said, quote, It's not possible to overdose on fentanyl by touching it. If it was absorbed well through the skin, people wouldn't inject it and snort it in order to get high. Well, if you're gonna use logic. Yet the Ohio Attorney General's office said in a press release, quote, Fentanyl is so dangerous that even the slightest exposure can be deadly. No word on how hospitals have been able to use it safely for years. Also, they never seem to publish the toxicology reports establishing the officers had any fentanyl in their systems at all, let alone an overdose. By the way, that press release was written by Mike DeWine, who is now governor. A study published in the journal Harm Reduction showed that there were 150 such reports in 2017 alone and a study in the Journal of Medical Toxicology traced the claims back to 2013, noting that they increased in 2016, the same year the DEA issued a warning saying, quote, Fentanyl can be absorbed through the skin or through accidental inhalation of airborne powder. One of those submitting a bogus report was Chris Green of East Liverpool, Ohio. He described his overdose in detail, but none of the symptoms match actual fentanyl overdose. Green even said on CBS News, quote, The opioid crisis is not only dangerous for those addicted to the drugs, but also for first responders. But it is apparently creating psychosomatic effects. After a believed exposure to fentanyl, even if it turns out there was no fentanyl at the scene, officers suffer panic attacks or a nocebo effect, which they then claim are overdoses. Ryan McNeil, assistant professor of medicine and public health at Yale University, said, quote, It's galling that we're treating a panic attack as an overdose when it's not even how an overdose presents. Some of them produce enough ham to feed an orphanage, like Deputy David Faive, who, on body camera footage, touched a powder and fell to the ground with another officer shrieking, I'm not going to let you die! They are not up for Oscar consideration. Doctors and experts are pushing back. Over 400 physicians, nurses, and public health researchers signed a letter saying, quote, This is dangerous misinformation that can cause harm to both people who use opioids and members of the law enforcement community. First, the misinformation exacerbates stigmatization of people who need support in the midst of a public health crisis. Second, and most crucially, the disinformation may delay a timely overdose response while first responders waste time donning unnecessary personal protective equipment. Finally, first responders may suffer emotional trauma if they believe that passive exposures put their lives at risk, even if that belief itself does not correspond to reality. Bystanders and first responders can safely respond to a suspected overdose without concern that they will be harmed by accidentally inhaling powdered fentanyl or absorbing it through skin contact. They implored police and journalists to publish retractions correcting the misinformation. I hope they're not holding their breath. Meanwhile, cops are adding on much more serious charges like assault or endangerment of police officers to the drug charges every time there's an arrest because of overdoses that are impossible. And this is happening everywhere, at every level, from local cops to the DEA. And the courts continue to cut them every bit of slack and take their completely disproven testimony as gospel truth. Meanwhile, they're making it even more difficult for addicts to get help and costing the taxpayer untold amounts for bringing in emergency equipment where it isn't needed. 
This is the new tactic in the fear-mongering about the bogus opioid crisis, using illicit fentanyl as if it's the new public enemy number one, while at the same time saying it's the fault of people taking prescription opioids. And nobody notices the blatant contradiction. So all of that makes cops this week's... Idiot Extraordinary! Well, that wraps up this, and since you're clearly as mad as a mongoose, I'll bid you farewell, edition of the Bogosity Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please go to donate.bogosity.tv for several ways to support, and discord.bogosity.tv to join the discussion. Subscribe at Patreon or Subscribestar, and you can listen early and ad-free. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Albert Camus. The welfare of the people in particular has always been the alibi of tyrants and it provides the further advantage of giving the servants of tyranny a good conscience. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Bogosity. We live in a world where light bulbs connect to the internet, and recent attacks on them prove that your online security is under threat like never before. Not only your websites, but the internet-enabled devices you buy. And the biggest problem is weak passwords. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords on the web and on your internet-enabled devices, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers, all your computers, and even your mobile devices, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, software licenses, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications, manage passwords for your entire family, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now.